motivational speaker, and so, so, so much more. And she's going to tell us all about that this morning, of course. Magistrate Camille Akande, she's with the Lucas County Juvenile Court. And then Dee Washington is with Harbor Behavioral Health, I think. But what's most important to know about these women is that they are all mothers. And so that is why we are here today, to talk about uh, motherhood and mental health within our minority community. So, Diana, I'm going to start with you. Um, I'm going to give you all, you know, uh, give us your elevator pitch. Mm. Not too long. Yes. Maybe 30 seconds 30 or so. Seconds. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Diana Patton, and I am a social justice advocate, former civil rights attorney, and the founder of the Rise Advocates Academy. I help professional women overcome challenges, trauma, to really advocate for themselves and to gain the confidence to speak up and to advocate for causes they believe in, but specifically diversity, equity, and inclusion. I also help organizations in the area of leadership development and diversity, equity, inclusion. How's that? That was perfect, <laughs> wasn't it? All right. <laughs> Magistrate Akande. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Camila Akande. I am originally from South Carolina. I've been in Ohio for about 20 years now, in the Toledo area for about seven years. I have been in the law practice for about 17 years now, and I currently serve as a magistrate in juvenile court. I would consider myself a wounded healer. That's good. Listening to the stories this morning, and I'm sure the stories of the people that are in their room, we've probably all had things that happen to in our lives. But as I've been to things I've been through, I use those experiences to help other people and walk with other people, walk their journey, you know, to their place of healing. So I have a heart to see families reconcile, families heal, people being the best version of, their, of themselves, empowering others to see what I see in them, and understanding that whatever they have experienced in their life does not dictate who they can become in their future. So that's my heart, that's my passion, and that's why I'm here today, because I am passionate about mental health and about people being healthy and whole and being honest about where they are in life. So thank you so much for inviting me, and I love that we're talking about this topic because I love seeing people hold and heal. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's just, I was thinking, of, do I have to turn it on, but I can hear it now. <clears throat> I'm Dee Washington. I am the manager of prevention education at Harbor. I have a master's in clinical counseling with a focus on uh, youth in crisis. And I accidentally fell into the world of drug prevention. Um, wanted to be in private practice, but during my internship, externship, I was working doing prevention. And my passion took me down that road. It was really nice to be able to be on the prevention side before people had or young people had to go see a therapist or a counselor. So my background, 90 some thousand dollars later in student loans, um, I kind of went down a different road, but I'm still utilizing the skills that I went to school for, but we're at, I'm at the other side of trying to make sure that we're creating healthy young people. I work in prevention across the lifespan. Um, we used to say diapers to diapers, and our older uh, um, citizens did not like that. <laughs> So um, we was, well, we would say cradle to grave. They said we, we like diapers to diapers better. But I do do prevention, and what I love about the work that we do is even at the age of a senior or older um, adult, prevention is still important. And the mental health, we have to think about our seniors. My oldest graduate of a six-week program was 103 when they graduated. They went to all sessions. But being able to talk to them about things that 50 years ago we didn't talk about. 
And so I really am excited about the idea of being able to talk about these things. Of course, we're going to focus on our African American community, but I just like being able to touch people where they've never had that education or that voice or that ear before. Um, so again, I do uh, prevention in the community, but I do have a focus on youth that are in crisis, and a part of that is also being a part of, a part of um, my story that you'll hear later is being a mom and going through my own mental health journey. All right. So um, we are going to have a conversation, I think, for a few minutes, and then again, um, we're going to open it up to you all to have, if you have any questions for these women, so be thinking about that as we have these conversations, because I'm sure you're going to come up with something that I haven't even thought about. Um, Diana, I definitely want to start with you. You know, I, I did read through your bio, and you talked about being born into this complicated world and complicated family, and, and one of the things that really stood out, you talked about having to ask advocate for yourself as a young child. And, and I can only imagine um, women who are mothers and that need to advocate for yourself. What does that look like to you? And, I, and I'll open it up to the rest of you as well. So just to clarify what that meant, I was born in 1968. I'm 25. No, just joking. <laughs> I got a lot of my, I, I do a lot of uh, uh, work with young people, and they're always like, this year, she's like my grandma's age. Um, and I had a white dad and a black mom in Fostoria, Ohio. That's the complication. Two months before Martin Luther King was killed. So I didn't recognize all of this, but everybody let me know. <laughs> I wasn't black enough to be black, and I wasn't white enough to be white. And so that was my experience, having five older sisters and one younger brother. But the real complication came in was that my father was abusive, and nobody came to our aid. So I realized when my father tried to sexually uh, molest me, I pushed him away. Not a lot of 14-year-old girls were doing that, at least not that I knew of, and they're still not doing that. So i have you could say I've been an advocate my whole life, but I definitely was an angry black woman. And I definitely went to law school for the very reason of kicking everybody's ass. But then I found Jesus, and I have been working on healing. <laughs> okay? I have been working on healing. So the advocacy that I come from, I mean, I have a lot of, st a big story. I wrote a whole book about it called Inspiration in My Shoes to talk about my path because in my DNA is trauma. And once I read the book, The Body Keeps Score by Dr. Bezel Vanderkoff, and understanding racial trauma and learning about trauma, how to become an effective advocate can't come from an unhealed space. So I had to learn forgiveness. I had to learn surrender. I had to learn what it was like to really be an overcomer of trauma. So when we say we shall overcome at civil rights rallies, the overcoming comes deep within your soul first to become an effective advocate. And that is my biggest message. Um, and I'll just I'll just um, move on because you talked a little bit about trauma yeah. and and uh, Magistrate Conde, yeah. you know you had been talking about uh, being a wounded healer and passionate about helping families heal from their trauma. What does that look like in your day to day position dealing with young people? And then also, what kind of patterns are you seeing within the court when it comes to the trauma that these young people are facing? I think first. What I have to realize is when they come to juvenile court, they may have been accused of committing some type of crime. And a lot of times people are reporting their behaviors. But what we're talking about, what we're looking at is the symptoms of what they have been through. The symptoms of what has happened in their life or what is happening in their lives right now. So a lot of times we want to come in and we want to treat a symptom, but we don't know the root cause of why they are in there in the first place. That's right. 
And what I'm seeing is a lot of times, I think someone said earlier, um, they're angry. This young lady is angry and she won't listen to anyone or he's angry, he won't listen to anyone, he won't do anything, he won't go to counseling, he's struggling in classes. And then I started to ask the questions, trying to get to know them and learning about their history and their life. And I realized, and I'll tell them sometimes, oh, you have a right to be angry. So we were just talking about being an attorney, but being humans first and recognizing that they've been through so much in their lives and no one has even taken the time to ask them what happened to you or how are you feeling and why are you angry? And when they tell me why they are angry, when we get to the root cause of it, I say, you know what? You have a right to be angry about what had, has happened to you. At this point, it's okay to be angry, but what do we do with that anger? And so until we can identify the root cause, we can't get to um, the problem solving, we can't get to the healing, we can't get to um, the treatment if we ha can't even ask the question, why? So we may be sending people to do this program or that program or putting maybe sanctions in place, but that's not their issue at all. They're hurting from something that happened last week or two years ago. So what I see is not only do I see kids who've come in with um, a lot of tough life circumstances or what I would call, in my view, trauma, multiple traumas, but you have a whole family who's been in trauma. So you're bringing me this young person and saying that, okay, we wanna help this person get on the right track, but truth is, mom has her own trauma. Dad may have his own trauma. Grandmother, lots of grandparents are raising their children and they have their own trauma. They've been through a lot. And I have to say to the whole family, like your family has been through a lot and there needs to be healing that it needs to take place in the entire family. So I can't, I'll tell them, I wish I could push a button and make it all okay, but it's gonna take time. It's gonna take time to dig deep, to talk about these issues, and it's not gonna change overnight. It's gonna take a process. So that's what I see um, in juvenile court. I see generational trauma. I see the reluctance, especially in our community, to go to counseling. And when they do, connecting them to the right people. And so, um, so that's my, that's what I see, the need of asking the right questions caring about this person that's in front of you and being open and honest. And also, I'll just say this last thing, I'll be quiet. Um, empathy or sympathy. And, and it's can great I, to hear. Can uh, I yes, answer that? Please, please. Thank you. I believe a lot of people in this room have very high positions and we've got authority. And I, first of all, want to say everything she said, if you can take that and really begin to learn about trauma, because a lot of you, we don't know. I didn't know anything about adverse childhood experiences until just eight years ago. We all need to read the book called The Deepest Well by Dr. Nadine Burke. You need to watch her TED Talk. She's a former Surgeon General who did work on trauma. And the book I referenced before, which is The Body Keeps, Bo Body Keeps Score by Dr. Bezel van der Kolk, K-O-K. -K. And the reason why I want to emphasize this is because the systems are failing our kids. The systems were set up years ago, legal system, school system, police and fire systems, were set up without trauma 
informed practices. We are just learning these things. And so every single person in this room needs to learn exactly what she said so that we can change the system. And you have to be willing to put your neck out on the line and possibly not be liked and change the system. And if you get in trouble for putting your neck out on the line, I've renewed my license. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and speaking about trauma, you think about crisis, right? And so D, you know, looking, looking a little bit um, at your bio, you talk about being, having a master's in counseling with a focus on children in crisis. And so you're helping children in crisis, but then you've also had your own personal situation at home, being a mother and dealing with mental health issues, whether it be for your children, for yourself. Talk a little bit about that. Tell us a little bit about your story and how you've worked through some of those challenges. Right. Well, first of all, I'm still working through it. <laughs> Every day is a journey. Um, I am a single mom of two girls with two baby daddies, but they are fathers. Um, I had to make some hard choices younger, but I was diagnosed with de major depression um, in 92. And one thing I do want to encourage women, especially women of, of all backgrounds, I was diagnosed with depression, however, I was pregnant and didn't know I was pregnant. So I used to take those questions lightly when they would ask, are you pregnant? Are you breastfeeding if you have a kid? Are you planning on being pregnant? Because of the medication that they were going to prescribe me. I didn't know I was pregnant until my sixth month. So I was losing weight. I was working out. I still had my period. And I didn't know it. So for me, in that moment of being diagnosed as majorly depressed, there was also the potential that my pregnancy was working its magic on my hormones as well. So I encourage people that as you are going to seek mental health and you are a female, if you're within that childbearing years, make sure that you are someone that, that, you're, that you're not pregnant. Because I, did, first of all, did not know I was pregnant. Um, so that brought along guilt because I was taking these medications and didn't know that I was pregnant. Um, at that time, I was a young lady with a, a bachelor's degree, but I was, you know, I was in my 20s and I was working at the bar and I was drinking every night, you know, at the end of the bar, at the end of the night, you know, everybody's buying rounds. So I had a lot of um, guilt when I had my child. One of the things that I could focus on, which I think is interesting, my kids are biracial, but my oldest is half Mexican. I remember the only thing I could talk about was, I hope she has good hair. Because I didn't want to address the other things that I knew that were in the back of my mind. And my family was like, why are you so worried about good hair? You got good hair too. I, but I couldn't bring myself to say that I could possibly be birthing someone who had any kind of mental health issues, any birth defects, et cetera. So that just sent my depression even further, the denial of that. Um, I did find out later that my daughter has fetal alcohol effect. Um, we did not recognize it until she got into high school. And I blame myself for that. That is something I have to deal with when I watch a 28-year-old who can't hold a job. Like, what could I have done differently? So that guilt kind of hangs on. Um, both, I have major depression. Both of my daughters, my youngest is bipolar. We are still working with my oldest. There's a potential that she might be borderline, borderline personality, but she's refusing to seek treatment. So that's hard when you have an adult child that you care about. <laughs> It's like, now I've got to figure out, am I going to try to get guardianship over you? Because she's still functional. So how do I balance that? And what is that doing to her mental health? To say that I, I don't think you can take care of yourself. You know, she worked for Jeep and made more part-time in half a year than I did in a year with a master's degree. So she's still functional, but she has those pieces. But those parts of me that go back and I think, what did I do wrong? Um, so... A long story short, there's three adult women, because my, my parents have always held on to our family homes. So one of our family homes is my inheritance and with my daughters. So first of all, you never want three grown adult women in a house. 
You also don't want three grown women with mental health issues <laughs> in a house. So I'm gonna promote the wellness center that, uh, from neighborhood properties. <laughs> if you need a break, you gotta get a break. <laughs> But I do, I really truly believe, I really do believe in that and I care, encourage my kids because sometimes we got to get away from each other, but we're also each other's support. And so that is a whole toll that we take on each other as well. Um, but having gone through that, I think those guilty feelings, whether you have a healthy child or not, when you, if you don't real, realize something or you've done something wrong, um, my youngest child, I dropped her on her head. I mean, I didn't do it on purpose. The car seat was not latched right, and when I pulled her out, she flipped out. <laughs> so then I'm looking, okay, now did I do some damage to my child that way? So the guilt of all the little things that we do build up. My youngest also, I was in a very violent relationship. He threw me down the stairs in my eighth month. He held me out of a window my ninth month. My daughter was born with anxiety. As soon as she could walk at nine months old, she was standing between me and her dad trying to pull us apart at nine months old. So her anxiety has been building from birth. Like that womb stuff is real. Um, and so I had to make a choice as well. Here we go with that mom guilt. I had to pull my daughter away from her father. I asked for child support. I raised both my kids with no child support. And we know how expensive they are. I had to pull my daughter away because she would break out in hives at the age of two when I told her that she was gonna go visit her dad. She would stand on the porch and throw up at the age of two just because her anxiety was so bad. I had to make a choice for 10 years for her to not be connected to her dad. So there's also guilt in why do I make poor choices in the men? So I just wanna be able to come here. Like I said, I, I wear my Harbor badge, but today I'm Dee Washington, I'm a mom. And I wanna say that, you know, we are all in this together. <laughs> um, whether it's something major or minor, but we have to be able to recognize that. My mom, I felt, we were talking parents not loving you. I wanted to know why my mom didn't like me. My mom used to tell me, I wish you had not been born. I didn't want to have children. Your dad was going to Vietnam and he wanted to leave a legacy. That's why you're here. Come to find out later when my mom died and I was her caregiver. So imagine somebody saying they hate you so much and you're her power of attorney and you're her caregiver. That was hard work. That was a mental mind, you know what, as well. So I'm taking care of a person who every day told me I didn't, I didn't deserve to live. I was trying to poison her. I was trying to kill her. But I was the one who had to make the health decisions for this lady. So I think when she died, what I found out was my mom had also gone through her own traumas. She didn't really know how to be a mom because her mom was being beaten up, thrown downstairs. And everyone said, you have no idea how much you're like your mom. And your mom was watching a path or a, a journey that she didn't want you to go down, but she didn't know how to protect you. She just wanted you to be hard. So again, now after my mom dies, I'm missing her because I didn't know that story. And that's why I think it's important when I talk with my daughters, we're all in therapy, we have to share, we have to support each other. And we're gonna have bad times, we're gonna have knockout drag outs, trust me. <laughs> we will have those moments. And I'm like, please don't call the police neighbors, because we will have some moments. But at the same time, I think it's important for all of us to be able to talk about where we're coming from, how we're feeling, because right now I have a hole in my heart because I could have had a better relationship with my mother if I had known about her mental health issues if we were all open and, and talking as families, right, especially within mm -hmm. in, in our community. Yes. Um, being a healthcare provider, do you think that that's helped you in, in what you're going through personally, or has it hindered you? I'm going to tell you right now, I think it has helped me, but what I did learn was I was out trying to save the world, and I wasn't always focused on my home. Mm -hmm. So I would go out and help parents do parent. I would do parenting programs. And in the meantime, my kids are like, I'm telling my oldest daughter, who's eight years older than her sibling, can you make sure her homework's done? Can you feed her? Because I got to do a parent class tonight. So I was so busy helping the world. And I have met people who have come back and said, what you did for me was helpful. But in the meantime, my kids were suffering. 
I also had a breakdown in the middle of a training. I am a master training trainer for the ACT, Raising Safe Kids, um, through the American Psychological Association. And one of my mentors, Michelle Knox, from Cobacker at UTMC, I always gotta put her out there because she's so great. I was um, set up to do a training of trainers. The day before my daughter, my youngest, was 12, she tried to commit suicide. So I'm in the front of this group going, I can't do this. How am I gonna train parents when I can't even keep my own children safe? So it's kind of good and bad, but I think, you know, when you are a provider, I mean, real life still happens. I am no expert. I'm only the expert on my own life. But I can, I can, I can um, impart knowledge to people because I have to go back and remember. I have notes on my door. I have things from my trainings on my mirrors in my bathroom to let me know today is another day. Today is a new day. And you're not perfect. And you're going to mess up. But I literally walked away from that training. And Michelle said, this is what they need to hear. you got to come back up here and do this training. So that, I mean, I, if that made sense, I'm just saying it's a good thing and it's a bad thing, but it actually broke me down because I felt like I had nothing to contribute because my kids were dealing with so much. How do I tell other parents something when my own kids are going through something? So it's kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a really weird thing to balance. Yeah, and, and I think we heard some of that from Andrea this morning about taking care of yourself. You're so busy, you know, out there in the world doing everything for everybody else, but what about, what, what are you doing for your home? What are you doing at home? And speaking of at home, Diana, you know, you've experienced your own challenges when it comes to mental health. Um, talk a little bit about that and, and, and how you are healing. Are you in the process of healing? Have you Healing healed? never ends. <laughs> I feel for me, I shared just a snippet of that story at 14, but then seeing from the beginning of my life trauma. It doesn't go away just because I became a lawyer. And that's the difference I think a lot of people think. Because we get these degrees and we're professor so-and-so, but you've never, ever, ever dealt with your own trauma. And now that you know that the body keeps score, and now that you know that there are these things called adverse childhood experiences, I would believe that every single one of us is just oppressed by our own trauma. Because most people go into their professions because of their experiences, right? So for me, I went through the deepest depression after George Floyd. I, I, I've always dealt with trauma by, I'm a runner. I mean, I've been an athlete my whole life. Why I went into running track and playing basketball in high school was actually what saved me because it was what I used to keep me, you know, like that was my therapy. And I didn't know until later reading all these books that, oh, running has so many benefits. And now I do yoga. Um, and yoga has a plethora of benefits. And so people are like, oh, you're always doing that. You're always did it. I'm like, because I'm trying to stay sane. After George Floyd was murdered, I had no place to go. I was, my, my fix was always keep going. Go, 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 right? Write another paper. Be seen, be heard. Uh, what? And when George Floyd was murdered, I literally went through the deepest depression. I lost 15 pounds. I couldn't swallow. I thought I had throat cancer. I uh, was constantly fidgeting. I felt I was getting up to get on my yoga mat, but then I would just cry. And then I would crawl back to bed. And once my husband saw me withering away, he was like, what are you? The difference, I never, ever did therapy. Ever. I went one time when I was in law school after my brother took his life. He committed suicide in 1994 and I was in law school. And that was, of course, nine months before he tried to kill my mom. I never knew that. I went in there and I told the therapist that. She's looking at me like, and I go, what? 
She was, that's a big deal. And I go, I know, but can you tell me, is there a pill I can take? Because I'm trying to figure out, I got I got a test I got to take next week. You know, I'm in law school and I'm asking these questions. She said, oh, you need to have all this therapy. And I looked at her and I, she was crazy. This is in 1995. And I looked at her and I said, I don't have time for this. I left. And then George Floyd happened. <laughs> Fast forward how many years, because the body keeps score. I was depressed clinically. And then I realized how much work I had to do. I went into serious therapy. And my kids, you know, they've known me to always be this, I'm into integrative health. I'm a yogi. I'm into all this other stuff. But I never, ever really, truly faced my trauma. And so the therapy that I went through, so for those of you, if this resonates with you at all, if, if these stories, this is why stories matter, if these resonate with you and you're sitting up here, because we professionals, we don't like to talk about our trauma because we don't want people to think we're not competent to do our work because we've been told in the black community what stays in this, what goes on this house stays in this house. And don't shame our family and Jesus can work it out, which Jesus can work it out, but you need therapy, sis, and bro. And I believe a lot of us have poo-pooed therapy for so long that I was even looking at it like it was crazy. I almost died. My brother committed suicide and my sister committed suicide. But I, of course, couldn't have done that, but I almost really came so close. And thank God I came out of that. It took a whole year. And that's why I'm on fire for mental health. Yeah. Um, you know, Magistrate Akande, I, I'd love to hear as a mother, you know, as, as a professional that's out in this world, uh, you know, public facing, how, how do you come home and, and how do you decompress from your day? I can only imagine when you're hearing the trauma of these young people and what they've gone through, what that does to you. Um, what do you do for yourself? And well, I think self-care is very important, and I think it looks very different for different people, and it looks different for me at different times. Mm. So, number one, I have my own therapist. Like many people have talked about here today, I've been in a church, and if there was something significant, it's just like, take it to Jesus. <laughs> and I'm like, but you don't understand, like, these things are happening. It's just like, you're not praying enough. Mm. You're not fasting enough. You need to fast and pray. And so I was told that for so many years until I got to a point where I realized I, I'm depressed. Because who do I talk to? Sometimes when you're in a certain point in your life, who do you go to, you know, for your problems? Who do you go to when you're struggling? If you're lucky, you may have one or two friends that you can talk to. But some things you want to say that you feel like you can't say to anybody. So eventually I was able to go to a therapist and it saved my life. And it's a place where I can go and say whatever I want to say, how I want to say it, and have no judgment behind it. So number one, I'm a huge advocate of therapy. And I've had a therapist for years and um, there's no shame. And for so long, especially in the African American church, there's so much shame. It's like you're not as strong of a Christian. No, I love Jesus, but I also knew someone to process what's going on in my life. Mm -hmm. And there are some things that I want to say about my family, especially, or certain things that you can't say out loud to most people because mm -hmm. you're not you don't you're not supposed to say that. So that's one thing I do. Number two, I realize how to say no. Because sometimes we're talking about, I think, women, period, we say yes to so much, whether it's something in the community, it's a family issue, um, if you're professional, this committee and that committee. And um, like Dee was saying, I got to a point where I was on all these committees, serving on boards, I had my son at all these activities, and I felt like I was doing it. And so I found him on the floor one day, and he wouldn't get up. Mm. I saw his behavior was changing. I could tell he had a cough and something was going on. My baby was drowning, but I was too busy to even see it. And so what I did was I told people, 
sorry, can't do that anymore. Nope, I have to withdraw from this board. No, I'm not gonna be at that event. Um, no, I can't be a part of that. And that was hard for me because I, this is like who I am. I'm supposed to do these things. And I realized, no, I'm supposed to be this boy's mom. And so when I withdrew and I was totally focused on getting help from my son, I realized that I was tired too. And I was going and going and going and I had more time to myself and I liked it. <laughs> I don't have to go on a Zoom call. I don't have to run to a meeting. I don't have to do this. And I enjoyed my peace. And I recognized I was becoming a more peaceful person. Um, my anxiety level went down. Um, I was enjoying life better because if I just wanted to go home and sit on my patio and watch my son play, it brought peace to me. People have sent me recently, like, something's different about you. You seem, like, happier because I learned how to say no. Mm. And I learned sometimes there may be a great event going on, but I'm going to sit on my couch and watch Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's different. If it's getting a pedicure, if it's um, hanging out with a good girlfriend, like, hey, I'm having one of those days. What are you doing? You want to go, you know, out to a restaurant? So it doesn't have to be the same thing all the time. It is different for different people. But find the things that bring you peace. Yeah. Number one, eliminate negativity and toxicity. I think so many times, you know, as women, as black women, we want to be all things to all people at all times. And sometimes when we do that, it can be draining, because some, it can be draining. Sometimes you, you're inviting toxicity and negativity into your life. And not saying you can't be there for that person, love that person, but sometimes you can't be available. You may not have the emotional energy. And also, you got to have people around you who pour into you. If everybody in your life is pulling from you, you're always giving, 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 and nobody is pouring into you, you need to invite some more people in your circle of influence. So also having those people who can speak life into you. I have a friend out there. Um, from work and I remember I would go to their office to get filled up. I would just be drained mm -hmm. and but I would leave feeling like superwoman all over again. So you got to have people in your life who pour into you. So you can't be there for your son the way you want to be, your, your child, your daughter. You can't show up for work or for a committee or boards. You can't really show up the way that you want to show up unless you're filled up and you you have that rest and that energy and that positivity and peace that you need you're your best self when you're healthy yes. I want to open it up to questions now. We might have time for maybe two questions. I'm not sure where we are, Sonia, but <laughs> okay, okay. I, I, well, I want to I want to open it up for questions. If if anyone in the audience has anything they'd like to ask the panelists, yes. Thank you. I have a question for Magistrate Conde. Uh, you spoke about um, uh, the children being angry. I work in a program uh, with school-age children, 7 to 17, and we have had such an influx in number in grandparents who are looking for help now because they are, for one reason or another, uh, they've become parent guardian of their teenage adolescent grandchildren. They are afraid. They want help. They don't know what to do. Uh, but when I suggest that they go to our resource people who can guide them to, uh, you know, some people that they can look into and see what's the best fit, they are afraid. And a couple of those grandparents actually admitted that if I, what if when I find out that my teenage grandson is angry because of something the parents did to him and those parents are my children. 
So do you have, you know, any idea of what else we can say to these grandparents that get past the fear and actually do the res get the resources so that they can get some help? Because I keep reminding the grandparents, now that you're the parent guardian, the child is not the only one going through something. You are, too. So what, what can we say to these grandparents to get them past all that fear so that they can actually reach out, take the resources, and find someone that meets their needs? Yes, that's very, very challenging. We have way too many grandparents raising children. I see so many grandparents raising um, their grandchildren. I think the first thing is we have to validate um, what they're saying. What I mean by that is I've had grandparents come and they're there for a court case and they'll say, can I say something or can I come up? Just a couple weeks ago I had a grandmother and she's doing the best she can to raise her granddaughter who's doing many different things. And she came and sat, and she was sitting on her walker, and she cried with me about 30 minutes because she feels like I'm doing everything I can, yet my granddaughter is not changing. But her grandmother has experienced so much with both of her parents. And so the first thing I have to do is say, you know, I hear what you're saying. And I understand how difficult, you know, it must be for you. But I have those honest conversations, too. But the truth is, your grandchild has been through X, Y, and Z. And this is what their experience has been. And you may not understand all of it. I don't understand all of it. But there are people out there who can, who can help them. Um, and sometimes I'll say maybe hard to hear what your grandchild has been through. Maybe hard to hear that your daughter may have done this or your son may have done this. Doesn't change your feelings about your children. Doesn't mean that you can't still love them and care for them and want the best for your child. But you also love your grandchild. And right now your grandchild needs this help. And... It's not saying that you're saying that your child is bad, you know, your daughter is bad, your son is bad, but right now the immediate need is getting help for your grandchild. Because when you go home, I tell all of them, you want peace. Like your home is supposed to be your sanctuary. You want peace and you want your grandchild to be better. And even though you're providing a great home with structures and rules and they have everything they need, they've been living in chaos, say, 15 years or 10 years, and they don't know how to function in that environment. That's a lot of misconception sometimes. If you take a child out of a chaotic situation, they're going to be so happy and then everything's going to be perfect. They don't know that lifestyle. They may know chaos or abuse and violence or living in the street or being homeless. They've been through so much. And so they don't quite know how to function in that environment. It's gonna take time. So talking to them about being patient and saying, and it's not an indictment on you, I always tell them, this has nothing to do with you and your parenting abilities. You know, you love your grandchild. Um, I can see that you love your grandchild and I can see that you are doing everything you can and I commend you for that. But, you know, I'm not a mental health expert, but there are people out there who can help them. So we gotta get your ch grandchild um, connected to someone who can help them. And there are different therapists who specialize in different things, um, who may specialize in trauma or this or that, whatever the unique issue may be, let's work together. I'll tell them we're a team. Like, this is not my expertise, but we're a team. So let me help you connect to people who can help you out. And sometimes that's community advocates, that's organizations, that's connecting with people who have certain levels of expertise. They're saying, my child won't go to school. Uh, we have our educational specialist here. Let me see if I get the educational specialist to find out what's going on with school. So I think that you, again, validate Yes, it's hard. I understand what you're saying. Or, for example, I'm give this example. And how I know we have a little bit of time. I had a dad come in. His son um, had serious mental health diagnoses, and he's like, "I don't want to give my child medication." And this young man was displaying um, 
lots of like uh, serious behaviors. And he's just like, I don't want to give my child medication, and you know, we don't do that. And I said, I listened to him, let, it get, let him get it all out. And I said, sir, I understand. Historically, in our community, we do not like to give our kids medication. And we are very reluctant when people give our kids diagnoses or, you know, or diagnosis or want to put them on medication. That's very difficult. And I understand as a people, we're very leery. And we're very leery of sending our kids to therapists. But this is what... Um, they're telling this is this is what the reports are telling me this is what these are the behaviors that I'm hearing about this is what I observe and those the experts are telling me that he has this issue and he needs this medication I'm not the expert but they're telling me it's probably going to help him out and I always try to tell them well, we're a team so you're going to have a psychiatrist and you're going to have a therapist if you're taking the medication for some reason, you don't like how it makes him feel or like he's a zombie, have that communication. Call the doctor up and say, hey, this is how my child um, is functioning. Is this normal? Like, because maybe it's a lower dose. May, maybe it's a different medication. I was like, there are all types of medications. There, and if you're with a therapist and you have questions, talk to your therapist. Just like you're asking me questions, be open, be honest. Tell them how you feel. It's an open dialogue. Dialogue. And um, then he was like, well, yeah, maybe uh, maybe he needs a little bit of medication. He does have this, that, and the other. He said, maybe he needs a little dab of medication. <laughs> I was like, okay, let's start with a dab. We can deal with a dab. Maybe he needs a dab. But I, I listened to everything he had to say first, and I validated, like, you know what? As a people, it's hard for us. And we just don't want to give our kids medication, but this is what the research shows. So can we try it out? If we're going to come back to court. Let's come back in two weeks. Let's come back in a month, and we'll talk about it again. If you have a concern, bring your concern to me or whoever the team is. Call the doctor. Give your concerns. Tell, your, you know, tell them how you feel, and you work together until we can get to a point where your son is feeling better and he's in a healthier position. But I could have said, look, he needs to take X, Y, and Z, and he needs to do blah, 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 courts adjourn. Nope. I need to listen to him. He's a person who has legitimate concerns. And he has a son who's in trouble. And for me just to say, just give them, medic give, just give them medication and take him to therapy, he'll be fine. No, I need to listen to what his concerns are and try to connect and help him, walk alongside him to help him understand how this could be beneficial. So when we have people, especially in our community, who are reluctant, we have to be able to validate those concerns and say, I understand and talk about them, address those concerns, and say, I'm here. If you have a question, the doctor said something, uh, call me, or I can put you in contact with this person, and that person is an expert, and they can help you out. Because I'm sure, like, in your, you know, working with NAMI, you know a lot of therapists, a lot of professionals, and if something doesn't sound right, let me connect you to um, Heather Baker. She works with, t t you know, TPS, and maybe she can help you about, you know, what's going on with the medication and how he's getting medication at TPS. Does that make sense? So I think that's the biggest thing of just hearing them. Sometimes they just want to be heard, and they don't understand the system, and they need to be empowered. They need to know that. We're in this thing together. We're working together, you know, to, to help the kids out. You're not by yourself, and you're not the only person that's going through this. Other people are, but you know what? We'll make it together. I'll tell them, I can't make, push a button, make everything all right, but I promise you, I'll do everything I can to help you get to the other side. Okay. Can I, can I just say one thing? I know you're at time. Is there a resource guide for someone like her that would say, if you're, because see what happens, I believe I hear what you're saying too, because she, this, everything that she said could be packaged up into an, I always think Excel spreadsheet, but like a PDF that you could say, if this, then that. Because I think what I'm hearing you say is that a lot of people, we criminalize people. We criminal, we have a criminal school system. Like if you don't come to school, you're gonna go to, you gotta go to a, you know, if you don't do this, you got, it's a criminal, and you have to like break the law to get a service. And so what I want to know is a PDF that says here is if you have these kinds of things happening with your child, especially since your child, these children have been through the pandemic, 
they have trauma. Um, that we, because I've talked to so many school people and the teachers are like, it's, I can't even get them to sit in class. Yeah, because they're, they've been through trauma. Um, but like, and that would be helpful if they could have that, Sonia, like a PDF that could say, I'm like already trying to give something out, like for resources so that they know, oh, I can talk to Heather for this, or I can talk to, you know, um, um, harbor for this and I don't have to break the law to do it <laughs> you know what I mean like I don't have to have someone in jail or I don't have so that they can know here's what I can do right and so I think because a lot of people come to me as a lawyer and you know just because I know them you know and I'm like I'm looking for the handout to sh say here's this you know and that's what I was saying and Tiffany I'm not because I know where else I just wanted to say too if we're talking about that motherhood and the, the, the pieces to the to parents I never have seen my parents with emotion unless it was at a funeral. Right. So the mental health, so that superwoman thing that we talked about earlier, I think it is important that for me, my kids see my struggles, they see me cry, they see me when I'm angry, um, they help me process things because there's this open dialogue that it's okay to not be okay. Yeah. But I think as a mom sometimes as well, there are days where, granted I'm a professional and maybe a lot of folks are not in that background, I gotta take the professional hat off and I have to be mom and that's why I said I, I'm not Harvard today, I'm D. Washington today, but I have to take that hat off and sometimes I just sit and hold my kids when they are going through something and I need to keep my mouth shut. Sometimes I just have to sit there and let them cry and work it out for themselves as well because my brain wants to go to solutions. And sometimes as a healthy parent, we have to let them figure it out, but I'm going to hold you until you figure it out. So that's all. I just want to get that in real quick. <laughs> and any other questions? <laughs> oh. Let's wait till we get the microphone to you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the question I have stems from your comment about George Floyd and how it affected you. As a father and husband of a wife who I saw affected just like you behind that, who now, especially with what we have going on in the city now, you're not just affected and concerned by that, you're affected and concerned that the same fate can come to them just simply by who their acquaintances are, and they can be, uh, they, or your children can be damaged by who their acquaintances are. What do you need from us as fathers and as men when it comes to our reaction to those same things so that we don't create more emotional trauma for you because we have drastically different reactions to those same things. Mm. Oh, that's good. Got an hour. All right. <laughs> we got about 12 minutes. No. <laughs> Seven. Such a great question, and thank you so much for asking that, because my husband was, first of all, I have a white husband, and it was interesting during the pandemic, let's put it that way, because there's so much to say about that. I'm actually writing all about this, is the role of the spouse. I've been married 24 years, happily love my, I love my husband. We disagree often, but we're, we're going on 25 years of marriage. And the key, I think, for a spouse is to do what she just said. Listen. And my husband wants to go, in it, like a lot of spouses, into fix mode, right? It's fix, fix, fix. And so it was just sitting with me to get through that process. I didn't even know how to articulate what I needed. I just needed someone to hold space for me, which is something I believe even in our black community, we don't do, hold space for people. Um, we've been taught in my family, you, Jesus will work it out, and you, you beat him out, you beat it out of them. Right, because my grandparents were sharecroppers. Okay, but I'm thinking of the spouse in this situation, listen, 
and listen. And then listen some more. Because usually the usually you know, therapy, of course, is my, my reaction, which my husband was advocating for me to do. Um, but I also believe when it came to me, my husband then reached out to my family because I was really in a bad place. And he knew who to contact to talk to me. So that's also a good, but don't tell them that you talk to them to do, you know what I mean? Like, because then I'd be like, you mean what? You talk to so-and-so? I mean, it's a hard place being a spouse. Listen, you like, I can relate. Um, but I think it's listen, 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 therapy. Um, but because sometimes we don't always want to hear that from our spouses. How many got spouses in here don't want your husband telling you what to do? <laughs> Okay, you can relate, right? So he's like, well, what do we do now? I damned if I do, damned if I don't. I don't know, should I stand, should I sit, should I be quiet, what should I do? And uh, Erica over here, right? Because you've been married for a minute. But I think it's listen, listen, listen. And just allow us that time to process and pray and get people to come in and be allies for us. And know the resources. I think it's know those resources. Does that help? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've been with mine for 38 years. Yes. And I still, did, I still, I, I still, I still didn't know the answer. I know, right? You never probably will so, until you go to heaven. So I don't. I, <laughs> as men, we're outnumbered in the room, but we we need your help to help us understand what you need. Right. Yeah. Is is it about that communication, asking what she needs in, in that moment? Yeah. What do you think? Well, I wasn't gonna address it from a spousal um, point of view, but overall, just in my line of work, I need men to show up. <laughs> Your presence alone sets a different tone. Yes. In my line of work, we have women, lots and lots of women. But do you know who I see in juvenile court in my courtroom? Black boys. Yes. Some days that's all I see, black boys. And right now, most of the time, I see black boys with guns. And all gun cases, this is my opinion, are not the same. You may have a straight A student who carrying a gun because he feels like he needs protection to maybe a kid who's maybe actively involved in gang activity. But the truth is we have a gun problem yes. and um, you can have a kid who's never been in trouble. And there are things that young black boys are going through in the society that I can try to address the best way I know how to, but I I am not a black man growing up in, in Toledo, Ohio. I can empathize with them, I can talk to them, I can share with them, but when I walk down the street, it's different from when they walk down the street. That's right. There are things that they need to know about how to be a black man in society that I cannot teach them. I can encourage them and give them words of how to go forward, but I am not them. We need you guys to show up everywhere, in every profession, in the community, in um, mentorship programs, speaking at the high schools, speaking um, at the courts, speaking at the rallies, march down the street, speak at the local elementary school. They need to see you because there's a certain level of respect. There's a certain level of I don't have a man around, to be honest. And so they don't know what a good man looks like, or they don't know um, how to act in certain situations, and they don't know how to express their emotions sometimes, because we can sh um, express our emotions in different ways. And there are some things they don't want to tell mama, grandma. Even my son is six going on seven, and there are certain things he doesn't want to tell me because he doesn't want me to worry. Like, I'll have male friends will tell me, you know your son told me X, Y, and Z, but... He didn't tell me that. He said he didn't want you to worry about him. So there are some things that they need to talk to you about that we cannot address. And again, they need to see you in every walk of life. 
they need to see you. And sometimes a young man, you know, they're angry, they're upset. And I'm like, well, what is it? So and so like, you're smart, you're this, you're that, but you won't do anything. And then like, they're kind of shaking. They'll say, I miss my dad. Dad is, dad is just not there. What does that look like? I have my mom and my aunt, but there are some struggles I'm going through as a young man. I need to talk to someone, so they need to see you. And this is a very small example. Like years and years ago, I used to teach children's church, and I always try to recruit like people, young men to come in, because I had young men in my class. And I would be like, you know, sit down, so-and-so, be quiet, turn around. And one of my friends, finally he decided to come in and volunteer. His presence, his presence in the room alone, the whole tone changed. And the boys were jumping on him, they were laughing with him, they were joking with him. And I had been with these kids all the time, like, like what about me? <laughs> his presence alone, it was somebody who looked like them standing in that room that they could rough house with and they could play with in a way that I could not. And it was nothing against me, but you guys have qualities in the way that you are built that you can give them something that we cannot give them. Now, we do a great job with what we have. <laughs> now, we work hard, but we need you to show up. And we need you to show up for the boys in the community who don't have anybody else because there are some people on the streets are showing them a different way to live. The kids that I see in court, they're coming in younger and younger. 14 and 15 year olds, 13, 14 and 15 year olds. So these older people in the neighborhood, they'll tell them to go out and do this because they feel like, oh, nothing's gonna happen to you. You're young. They're using them to do certain things in the community. So they're speaking into their life. They're speaking into their, their head. What kind of voices are they hearing? It's gonna be you that's gonna come and show up in different spaces and be a different voice and show them what a man looks like and how to live as a man. Right. And that's what I say. We, in the wake of George Floyd, they need you. They tell me I'm afraid. One boy said to me, I mean, he's so sharp, articulate, he's just like, has it together. I'm like, well, why do you have a gun? He said, everybody my age can kill. Like, what you mean don't have a gun? Why don't I have a gun? He was just, and they've said that, like, I'm afraid. But he just said it, it was just like, very polished. He said, like, what you talking about? Everybody my age is getting killed. Of course I have a gun. That's the reality of what's happening on the streets of the city of Toledo. So with George Floyd, man, women, we can march and we can make our speeches, but we need you guys to be there to show up and show them a different way of life. And not just for an event. Yes. Because <laughs> we are some event people, but then we don't show up in everyday life. So consistency is key. And you can create your own programs, okay? I'll just say we got the head full of dreams and we do it at the L.A.P. Stewart Academy. I'll leave that commercial. For women, so it can be done for men. And we show up on the weekly, uh, actually bi-weekly, at the schools, in the schools, and the principals will invite you. So these men's groups can happen as they do with women's groups. So, but the consistency is key because these young girls get people who like to come in and have events and get their pictures taken with them. But then when they really need them, they're not there. So just so you know. Well, let's give these ladies a round of applause. Yeah.